Rotor balancing is a fundamental step in steam turbine maintenance. Imbalances in the rotor can cause excessive vibrations, leading to wear and tear of components. Fluorescent penetrant inspection FPI, is used to detect surface defects in critical turbine components. FAROARM measurement. FAROARM technology is utilized for precise measurements of turbine components. This portable coordinate measuring machine enables engineers to assess dimensional accuracy, ensuring that parts adhere to specified tolerances. The casings of steam turbines undergo dimensional analysis to verify their integrity and alignment. Boring encasing. Boring involves machining turbine casings to restore their original dimensions or create proper fits for new components. This step is crucial for maintaining the alignment of internal components and achieving optimal performance. Upspeed balance, a critical phase in steam turbine maintenance, is a meticulous procedure that aims to enhance the, tur the turbine's operational balance. Technicians methodically fine-tune the rotating components, meticulously adjusting their positions to reduce vibrations to the bare minimum. This precise adjustment not only fosters a smoother and more reliable turbine operation, but also optimizes its overall efficiency. The meticulousness of op-speed balance underscores its significance in maintaining peak turbine performance while mitigating potential disruptions. In cases where original blueprints or designs are unavailable, reverse engineering is employed. This process involves analyzing existing components to recreate accurate specifications. Submerged arc welding saw, is used for precision welding of turbine components. It provides high-quality welds and is particularly suitable for thick sections. After welding, post-weld heat treatment is performed to relieve residual stresses and ensure the structural integrity of welded areas. Metallurgical analysis involves examining the microstructure and properties of turbine materials. The overhaul begins with a thorough assessment of the gearbox's condition upon receipt. Engineers perform an initial inspection, which includes verifying the tooth contact pattern of the gears, this step helps identify any irregularities in the tooth engagement, guiding subsequent repairs. The next step involves disassembling the gearbox by carefully removing the rotating elements such as gears, shafts, and bearings. This dismantling allows for a detailed examination of individual components. The gear case is subjected to a 3D scanning and probe inspection. This non-destructive testing method reveals hidden defects, cracks, or deformities that might not be visible to the naked eye. It ensures a comprehensive assessment of the gear case's structural integrity. The bores within the gear case are inspected and probed to assess their dimensions, alignment, and overall condition. This step ensures that the bores are within the required specifications to accommodate the rotating elements accurately. Proper lubrication is vital for gearbox longevity. Engineers verify the lubricant delivery circuit to confirm that lubrication is reaching all critical components efficiently. Components prepared for this shutdown, such as new gears, shafts, and bearings, are carefully installed. Precise alignment and proper installation techniques are essential to ensure optimal performance. Tooth contact pattern verification of newly installed components. After installing the new components, engineers verify the tooth contact pattern once again. 
This step ensures that the new components are correctly aligned and engage smoothly. Installation of remaining components, other non-rotating elements, such as seals and gaskets, are installed to complete the gearbox assembly. Prepping gearbox for spin test. The gearbox is prepared for a spin test. All safety measures are taken, and the gearbox is properly secured to prevent any mishaps during testing. Spin test and condition monitoring. The spin test involves running the gearbox at various speeds to simulate operational conditions. Engineers monitor the gearbox's behavior, including temperature, vibration, and noise levels. Any abnormalities or deviations from expected performance are carefully observed and addressed. 1. Designing. The installation process begins with meticulous designing. Engineers and experts create a comprehensive plan that outlines the motor's specifications, such as power rating, 1400 minus 2240 kilowatts, synchronous speed, 28p, voltage, 3.3 kV, and other vital parameters. The design also incorporates factors like thermal management, vibration control, and safety features. 2. Frame fabrication. The motor's frame is the structural backbone that supports all components. The fabrication involves precision engineering and assembly of high-quality materials to ensure stability and durability. The frame's design is based on factors like motor size, weight, and the anticipated mechanical loads during operation. 3. Stator Coil Insertion Stator coils are integral to the motor's electromagnetic operation. The stator coil insertion phase involves placing carefully wound copper coils into slots within the stator core. These coils create the magnetic field necessary for motor operation. Precision is vital to prevent insulation damage and ensure consistent performance. 4. Super Global Vacuum Pressure Impregnation. This step enhances the stator's insulation properties and overall reliability. The stator windings are impregnated with epoxy resin under vacuum and pressure. This process eliminates air gaps, enhances thermal conductivity, and protects against environmental factors like moisture and contaminants. 5. Shaft Under Machining. The motor's shaft is a critical component that connects the rotor to the external load. Machining the shaft involves precision cutting and shaping to meet specific dimensional and tolerance requirements. A perfectly machined shaft ensures proper alignment and reduced vibration during operation. 6. Polar Wheel Machining Polar wheels are essential for the motor's stability and synchronization with the grid frequency. Machining the polar wheels involves precision shaping to achieve the desired rotor pole geometry. Properly machined polar wheels are crucial for synchronous operation and power factor correction. 7. Pole Assembly Assembling the rotor poles requires meticulous attention to detail. The poles are securely attached to the rotor's core, and their alignment is crucial for maintaining the synchronous nature of the motor. Any deviation can lead to operational inefficiencies and increased wear and tear. 
8. Arrival of motor at Australia. After manufacturing and initial testing, the motor is transported to its destination in Australia. This phase involves logistics coordination and careful handling to ensure the motor arrives in pristine condition. Nine, base frame fixing. Upon arrival, the motor's base frame is securely fixed to the foundation. Proper alignment and anchoring are critical to prevent vibration, misalignment, and other mechanical issues during operation. This step lays the foundation for stable and safe motor operation. 10. Motor under operation. With the base frame secured, the motor is connected to the electrical system. The operation involves controlled starting and synchronization with the grid frequency. The motor's performance is monitored for parameters like voltage, current, power factor, and efficiency. Any deviations are addressed promptly to ensure optimal performance. The journey of a scrap electric motor begins with its meticulous dismantling. This initial step is pivotal in the recycling process and takes approximately 90 seconds per engine. During this phase, the electric motor is carefully disassembled, separating its various components. This ensures that every part of the motor can be appropriately processed and recycled, maximizing resource recovery. Wrecking the aluminum or cast iron motor housing once the motor is disassembled, the next task is to wreck the outer housing, typically made of aluminum or cast iron. This is achieved through a powerful mechanical process that breaks down the housing, rendering it ready for further processing. The efficiency of this step is essential in reducing waste and maximizing the recovery of valuable materials. The heart of the electric motor lies in its stator, which contains essential components like copper windings and steel laminations. To extract these materials, the stator is split into two equal parts. This is achieved through precision engineering, ensuring a clean separation that preserves the integrity of the materials. Splitting the stator paves the way for the final and most critical step in the recycling process. Separation of steel and copper, the last step in scrapping electric motors, is the separation of steel and copper. This process is often achieved using sophisticated hydraulic mechanisms. Steel and copper have distinct properties, making them separable by hydraulic forces. The steel components are efficiently separated from the valuable copper windings, leaving them in a state ready for recycling. This separation process is crucial for recovering these valuable materials, which can be used in various industries, including manufacturing and electronics. Removing old windings from armature. Brand new Kamu Tater. High voltage pressure test. Bar Tober test. Insulation inserted prior to coil insertion.
Hytrax coils. Inserting coils. Positioning coil ends into new commutator. Slotting wedge to secure coils. Preparation for TIG welding. TIG welding. Lowering armature into VPI tank. VPI process setting pressures on tanks. Introducing resin to IMO regnation vessel. View inside VPI tank. Removing armature from VPI tank. Banding armature. Dial in dictator ensures armature is running true. Initial skim of commutator. Undercutting the commutator with automated undercutting machine. Laser guided precision for cutting accuracy. Touch screen controller with magnified view optimizes accuracy. Final skim of commutator with diamond tip tooling. Cleaning out debris between segments. Mechanical checks. Data logging. Balancing setup. Armature rotated to obtain balance results. Specified balance tolerance achieved by adding weights. Completion of balancing. Balancing report. The Darlington Nuclear Power Plant, situated on the shores of Lake Ontario, about 70 kilometers east of Toronto, is a significant contributor to Ontario's power generation. This facility, operated by Ontario Power Generation, OPG, plays a crucial role in producing electricity for around 2 million people, which accounts for about 20% of Ontario's electricity needs. The power plant is divided into two main sections, the nuclear side housing the reactors and the conventional side containing the turbine generators responsible for generating electricity. Darlington comprises four generating units, numbered one to four, each equipped with a reactor and a turbine generator. These units collectively have the capacity to generate 935 megawatts of electricity each. The heart of Darlington's power generation process lies in nuclear fission. The plant uses naturally occurring uranium that undergoes processing to form small pellets. These pellets are then sealed into metal tubes, creating fuel bundles. These bundles are inserted into the calandria, a large tank and the core of the nuclear reactor. Heavy water, which contains a heavier form of hydrogen called deuterium, flows around the fuel bundles. This heavy water slows down neutrons, increasing the likelihood of them splitting uranium atoms. This chain reaction releases an immense amount of heat into the heavy water, which is then used to generate steam. The heated heavy water flows through a closed loop system, ultimately transferring its heat to ordinary water, causing it to boil and turn into steam. 
This steam is directed at high pressure through pipes to a turbine, where it drives the turbine blades, resulting in the rotation of a generator's rotor. This spinning rotor, functioning as an electromagnet, induces electric currents in coils of copper wire, producing electricity. The generated electricity is then channeled into transmission lines that distribute the power to homes and businesses. Safety is a paramount concern at Darlington and other OPG facilities. Rigorous security measures are in place to monitor personnel and equipment entering and leaving the plant. Personnel are required to wear protective gear like safety glasses, hard hats, gloves, and more. A comprehensive system of zones prevents the transfer of radioactive materials between different areas. For nearly a century, the Jettenbach togging power plant and the Inn Canal have stood as symbols of innovation, progress, and sustainable energy generation. The journey that began in 1919 with the groundbreaking of the architecturally significant power plant building in Togingham Inn has culminated in a modern marvel that continues to power Bavaria with clean electricity from renewable sources. The historic journey of these power facilities took a significant leap in recent times, with the construction of a new power plant alongside the existing one dating back to 1924. This ambitious project was undertaken by VERBUND, with a mission to enhance the installed power capacity by an impressive 40%, while also boosting annual electricity generation by around 25%. This monumental upgrade now allows the togging site to generate enough electricity to meet the yearly demand of approximately 200,000 Bavarian households, making a substantial contribution to the region's energy needs. The revitalization of the Jettenbach togging power plant wasn't merely an expansion but a complete transformation, harmonizing the historic elements with modern advancements. The meticulous planning and execution of this project led to the construction of a new building adjacent to the protected power plant, one that seamlessly integrates with the original structure. This delicate balance of history and innovation marks the culmination of Germany's largest hydropower project, with an investment of around 250 million euros. The heart of this endeavor lies not just in construction, but in the commitment to sustainable energy sources. Bavaria's transition towards a cleaner energy future received a significant boost through the reliability of hydropower. The reinforcement steel for the tailwater power plant was laid in Jettenbach in May 2019, symbolizing the progress of this journey. Simultaneously, in Togging, earth was excavated on a massive scale, 100,000 cubic meters of it, to make space for the new power plant while preserving the historical significance of the original structure. The year 2020 marked the second year of construction, witnessing the securement of the excavation pit with 420 drilled piles, delving 30 meters deep and 70 meters into the ground. Meanwhile, in Jettenbach, the construction of the new weir system progressed steadily, a crucial component for diverting water towards togging for electricity generation. By the middle of 2021, significant milestones had been achieved. The machine hall was now a completed reality, equipped with an installed hall crane. The installation of supporting components like the scoop ring for Turbine 2 highlighted the intricate engineering involved. This was a period of intense effort as precast elements, some weighing up to 20 tons, were lifted into place by heavy-duty cranes, showcasing the collaboration of technology and human expertise. September 21st marked a historic moment, the shutdown of the 14 remaining machine sets still operational in the historic togging power plant after nearly a century of service. This allowed the inlet area to be drained, paving the way for the new chapter in energy generation. 
The year 2022 brought the project to its triumphant conclusion. After four years of relentless effort, machines one and two were completed. Precision and dedication were evident as technicians installed the impeller for turbine three with millimeter accuracy, followed by the placement of the over six meter long, 28 ton heavy shaft. As each piece was carefully integrated, the power plant's transformation neared completion. In January, the stator, a massive 110-ton component, found its place, followed by the rotor. The assembly of these components marked the realization of a powerful principle, electrical induction, which would be the driving force behind the generation of electricity. The culmination of this process was the successful initial test run of the machines, an important step towards validating their functionality. The achievement of the togging power plant was mirrored in Jettenbach, where the finishing touches were being put on the new power plant. Functional tests in various weir fields showcase the thoroughness of the project's execution. Finally, after four years of construction, the new togging power plant stood complete, a testament to human ingenuity, engineering prowess, and a commitment to sustainable energy. With three Kaplan turbines generating a total of 118 megawatts, the power plant now catered to the energy needs of 200,000 Bavarian households. The new capacity marked a significant milestone, offering nearly 25% more electricity compared to the older power plant, and all of it derived from renewable hydropower sources. The Eurasia Undersea Tunnel Project also known as the Istanbul Straight Road Tube Crossing Project, stands as a remarkable engineering feat that addresses the unique transportation challenges faced by the city of Istanbul. The city's position spanning two continents, Europe and Asia, has resulted in significant traffic congestion and socioeconomic burdens. The Eurasia Tunnel serves as a solution to alleviate these issues, providing a direct link between the Kazlicheshmegastepe route, which witnesses heavy vehicle traffic. Spanning a total length of 14.6 kilometers, the project is divided into three distinct sections, each tailored to optimize traffic flow and connectivity. The first section, situated on the European side, extends from the Kazlicheshme junction to the Kobansmi junction, covering 5.4 kilometers, this segment focuses on enhancing the current road system, incorporating junctions, road connections, and accommodations for pedestrians, ensuring easy access to the seaside. The centerpiece of the project is the 5.4-kilometer-long undersea tunnel, connecting the European and Asian sides beneath the Istanbul Strait. This critical portion is constructed using a tunnel boring machine, TBM, and comprises two decks, each featuring two lanes, Remarkably, the tunnel reaches depths of up to 106 meters, navigating the challenging geological strata of the seabed. Designed exclusively for light vehicles, the tunnel incorporates automatic toll gates, a main control building, and various safety features. The third section of the project encompasses modifications and expansions to the existing D100 freeway on the Anatolian side. Covering 3.8 kilometers, this segment extends from the tunnel exit at Ayub Oxide Junction to the Gostepe Junction. The upgrades include junction arrangements, connections, and provisions for smooth traffic flow. The project is a collaborative endeavor involving international engineering giants and state-of-the-art technologies. The Tunnel Boring Machine, TVM responsible for the undersea crossing, is produced in Germany, and ranks among the world's most powerful in its class, operating through varying geological strata, including rock formations and soft sea sediments. The TVM demonstrates the project's technical complexity and innovation. Safety remains paramount in the Eurasia Tunnel Project, and meticulous planning and advanced technologies are employed to ensure multidimensional safety for its users. The choice of materials is based on durability and easy maintenance, aiming to meet the stringent natural requirements of the tunnel's environment. The benefits of the Eurasia Tunnel are substantial. With 24-hour uninterrupted service, it is projected to reduce travel time between Gostepe and Kazlicheshme, 
from over 100 minutes during rush hours to just 15 minutes, accommodating more than 100,000 vehicles daily. The project, undertaken through the build-operate transfer model, carries a cost of $1.25 billion. The concession company, with financial backing from bank credit facilities and equity from sponsor companies, funds this ambitious undertaking. The significance of the project extends beyond its engineering prowess. It demonstrates a respect for heritage, as the tunnel's design preserves the iconic silhouette of Istanbul's historical peninsula. Moreover, the project adheres to environmentally friendly principles, respecting the ecological balance and minimizing harm to natural life. The Eurasia Undersea Tunnel Project serves as a testament to human innovation and engineering excellence. By connecting the European and Asian sides of Istanbul, it offers a transformative solution to the city's transportation challenges. This globally significant monument, blending cutting-edge technology with respect for heritage and the environment, stands as a symbol of progress and human values. In the year 2014, a monumental project embarked upon the landscape of bridge engineering, the construction of a cable-stayed bridge that would redefine transportation connectivity and architectural beauty. This ambitious endeavor encompassed not only the design and construction of a multi-user cable-stayed bridge catering to vehicles, cycles, and pedestrians, but also included the creation of supporting structures for the bridge approaches and the establishment of new highways to seamlessly integrate this marvel into the existing urban fabric. Spearheaded by the Sunderland City Council, the project unfolded with meticulous planning and execution, resulting in a remarkable feat of modern engineering and design. The design process was a collaborative effort between key stakeholders. The primary design, conceived by the Sunderland City Council, served as the foundation upon which a joint venture between AROP and FEKOR built a refined final design. This design envisaged a cable-stayed bridge characterized by a framed structure with imposing steel towers reaching an impressive height of 110 meters. Spanning 336 meters between its abutments, the bridge deck was meticulously crafted to accommodate diverse users, including a 1.8-meter central reserve, a dual 7.3-meter carriageway for vehicles, and a spacious 3.5-meter wide cycle and footway. The project's execution unfolded in distinct phases, the highway works and the bridge works, further divided into in-river works and approach structures. The highway component involved the creation of a new dual-purpose dual carriageway and a single two-lane carriageway intricately linked to existing urban roads and structures. The scope included earthworks, retaining walls, road paving, drainage systems, traffic signs, and landscaping, all of which seamlessly integrated the new arteries into the existing urban infrastructure. Central to this endeavor were the approach structures, the northern and southern underbridges and retaining walls. The meticulous design aimed to enhance the available land, thereby maximizing utility and minimizing disruption to the surrounding landscape. The heart of the project, the cable-stayed bridge, showcased engineering finesse and architectural grace. Rising above the waters, the bridge's iconic A-shaped pylon, soaring 110 meters high, captured attention. Strikingly devoid of a crossbeam at deck level, the pylon's legs boasted curved and flat surfaces, rendering a distinct aesthetic identity. The deck's design, featuring a ladder construction, simplified complexity while ensuring structural integrity. The longitudinal and transversal beams, interconnected and crowned with precast slabs, form the deck, further enhanced by an H2 containment class parapet housing integrated lighting columns. Underscoring environmental responsibility, comprehensive studies were undertaken to mitigate ecological impact on both the river and its environs. The intricate construction sequence involved nine distinct stages. The foundation stage began with installing piled pylon foundations using a board piling rig, followed by the creation of a coffer dam using sheet piles, facilitating the construction of the pile cap and establishing a sealed environment for subsequent construction. 
Collaboration with the local supply chain was pivotal, with a focus on community upliftment. Steel workshop facilities at Pallian Engineering Limited facilitated steel fabrication, while the dry dock at Pallian Shipyards transformed into a steel fabrication workshop, allowing seamless manufacturing of bridge components. The fabrication of the pylon and its segments, delivery by barge, and subsequent installation intricately choreographed the pylon's emergence. As segments came together, the bridge's cantilever deck construction commenced, involving careful segment placement, connection work, and installation of stay cables. Special consideration was given to segments installed using a crawler crane, circumventing depth limitations. An integral facet of the project was its social and local economy plan. This not only generated jobs and apprenticeships, but also nurtured the local supply chain, enriching the Sunderland community. The journey that began in 2014 culminated approximately 30 months later, yielding a testimony to human ingenuity and collaboration. As the sun set over the glistening waters of the river, the Cable Stayed Bridge stood proudly, a true fusion of design and engineering brilliance. It wasn't just a conduit for vehicles, cycles, and pedestrians. It had transformed into a symbol of architectural prowess, an embodiment of harmony between infrastructure and environment, and a testament to the indomitable spirit of progress. In retrospect, the Cable Stayed Bridge construction project of 2014 underscored the remarkable possibilities that arise when vision meets execution. Sunderland's urban landscape was forever changed, not merely with the construction of a bridge, but with the erection of an icon that seamlessly married form and function, engineering and aesthetics, innovation and tradition. This bridge became more than a structure. It became a part of the city's identity, a landmark that united generations through its timeless grace. A cable stripping machine is a specialized tool designed for efficiently removing the outer insulation or sheathing from electrical cables and wires. The primary purpose of a cable stripping machine is to separate the valuable copper or aluminum conductors inside the cable from the protective outer layers. This not only facilitates recycling efforts, but also allows for the reuse of these valuable metals in new cable manufacturing. Additionally, the removal of insulation ensures that the conductors are clean and free from any contaminants, improving the overall conductivity of the wire. The user feeds the cable into the machine where it is gripped and guided through a cutting mechanism. This mechanism either uses rotary blades or blades specifically designed for the cable type. As the cable passes through, the blades cut away the outer insulation while leaving the inner conductors intact. The stripped cable then exits the machine, ready for further processing or use. The conventional method of burning cables to extract copper is not only hazardous but also contributes to air pollution. Therefore, an alternative approach that avoids these problems is highly desirable. This method involves using basic tools like drills and screws, making it accessible to many DIY enthusiasts and recyclers. To begin, the first step is to secure the cable without setting it on fire. This approach recognizes the dangers associated with burning cables, such as the release of toxic gases, which can be harmful to both the environment and human health. The equipment needed for this method includes a table, a drill, a smaller drill bit, and a screw. Start by drilling a hole in the table to anchor the cable securely. Then, create a smaller hole on one of the cable's sides using a drill bit appropriate for the cable's diameter. For example, if you are working with a 10 mm cable, use a 10 mm drill bit. By carefully adjusting the hole size with a few passes, you can ensure a snug fit for the cable. Next, insert a screw into the smaller hole. This screw serves as a marker for the cable's plastic covering. Once the screw is in place, gently pull the cable from both ends. As you do this, the copper conductor inside the cable will gradually separate from the plastic insulation. This process may require some effort, 
but it is far less labor-intensive than burning cables, and it eliminates the pollution associated with that method. This simple yet effective method offers a safer and more environmentally friendly way to extract copper from electrical cables. By avoiding the harmful practice of burning cables, you not only protect your health, but also contribute to reducing pollution and conserving valuable resources. So, the next time you need to extract copper from electrical cables, consider using this method for a greener and cleaner approach. The motor at the center of this operation is truly the lifeblood of the dry dock facility at Pearl Harbor. Its primary responsibility is to power the pump responsible for the critical task of dewatering the dock. Without this motor's unwavering performance, the dry dock would be rendered inoperable, hindering the essential maintenance and repair work that submarines require. Submarines, being complex and sensitive vessels, rely on this dry dock to undergo meticulous inspections, repairs, and upgrades. Hence, the motor's significance cannot be overstated, making meticulous care and maintenance an absolute imperative to ensure the seamless operation of this vital naval infrastructure. The process begins with banding the rotor. This step involves securely fastening metal bands around the rotor's laminations to prevent movement and maintain structural integrity during the rewinding process. Before proceeding further, the rotor is inspected for any irregularities or imbalances. If imbalances are detected, precision balancing is performed. Skilled technicians begin by delicately removing the old winding, a process demanding precision and expertise. Once stripped of its previous windings, the stator core is subjected to a thorough cleaning and inspection. Every inch is scrutinized for signs of damage or wear, as even the slightest imperfection could compromise the motor's efficiency and reliability. This careful attention to detail in rebuilding the stator guarantees that it will function at its peak, supporting the motor in delivering consistent and robust power to the submarine dry dock's water removal system. To enhance insulation and protect against moisture and contaminants, the stator is subjected to vacuum pressure impregnation. In this process, the stator is placed in a vacuum chamber and a special insulating resin is introduced. Vacuum pressure ensures the resin penetrates every crevice, creating a robust insulating barrier. To further safeguard the motor against electrical discharge and corona effect, the stator is coated with a blue epoxy anti-corona paint. This specialized paint not only provides protection but also adds an extra layer of durability. After the epoxy paint has dried, excess epoxy is carefully removed from the motor's surface. With the rotor and stator both fully prepared, the motor is reassembled. Each component is carefully placed and secured to create a cohesive unit. The stationary runner, which helps channel water through the pump, is assembled and installed within the motor. This component is crucial for the efficient functioning of the pump. Before the motor is deemed ready for service, it undergoes rigorous testing. 
A custom-built stand is used for this purpose, allowing engineers to assess its performance under controlled conditions. The motor's efficiency, power output, and vibration levels are closely monitored to ensure it meets the highest standards. One of the key components of GE's low-head hydropower solutions is the Kaplan Generating Unit. Kaplan turbines are well known for their efficiency and adaptability, making them an ideal choice for low-head applications. GE designs and manufactures Kaplan turbines that are tailored to the specific requirements of each hydropower plant, ensuring optimal performance and power generation. Polypody thrust bearing rods are another crucial feature of GE's low head hydropower solutions. These rods play a critical role in supporting the thrust bearings, which are essential for the smooth operation of the turbines. GE's advanced designs and high quality materials ensure the longevity and reliability of these thrust bearing rods, reducing maintenance and downtime. GE's stator core pressing system is a testament to the company's commitment to innovation and efficiency in hydropower technology. This system is designed to optimize the manufacturing process of stator cores, resulting in higher efficiency and performance. By enhancing the core pressing process, GE ensures that the generators in its hydropower plants deliver maximum electricity output. The oil-free hub is another standout feature of GE's low-head hydropower solutions. By eliminating the need for oil lubrication in the hub system, GE reduces the environmental impact and maintenance costs associated with traditional hydropower installations. This innovation not only improves the overall sustainability of the power plant, but also enhances its reliability. In June 2012, Sheet Piling UK Limited was tasked with the construction of two circular cofferdams at the Outer Harbour Breakwaters, which formed the entrance to Great Yarmouth Harbour in the UK. The project came with strict requirements, including completing the cofferdam installation by the end of August 2012 and minimizing disruption to normal harbour activities and ship movements. The fast-flowing tidal conditions at the cofferdam location posed an additional challenge. To meet these conditions and tackle the tidal conditions effectively, Sheet Piling UK Limited opted for a construction method that involved pre-assembling the sheet pile cofferdams on adjacent key sites. This pre-assembly process allowed them to carefully interlock the sheet piles around a robust temporary work support frame on the key side. Special care was taken to ensure the circle closed without inducing strain. To execute the next phase of the construction, a jacket piling barge was mobilized and positioned at the intended installation location. A large shear leg crane barge, the Smith Tucklift 7, was brought in for the heavy-duty lifting tasks. The fabricated cofferdams, weighing about 400 tons each, were then meticulously lifted from the quayside and precisely floated into position using GPS positioning techniques. Once accurately lowered onto the seabed, 860 mm diameter tubular piles were vibrated to a depth of 5 meters to securely anchor the structures in place. Sequentially, the straight web sheet piles were driven to their designed level with the help of a crane-suspended vibratory hammer. To complete the cofferdams, hydraulic pumps were employed to place cell fill materials from a land-based stockpile. This innovative construction method allowed both cofferdams to be accurately installed at the harbor entrance within just one week, all while ensuring no disruption to normal harbor operations. Notably, this project marked the first time that such a method of constructing cellular sheet pile cofferdams had been employed in tidal waters in the UK. This groundbreaking 50-kilometer link will seamlessly connect three major cities, Hong Kong, Macau, and Zhuhai,
creating the Southern Ring closure of an extraordinary infrastructure project that will undoubtedly redefine connectivity and transportation in the area. Bauer's involvement in this colossal endeavor is channeled through its specialized subsidiary, Bauer Hong Kong Limited. The scope of work undertaken by Bauer Specialty Bau GmbH's subsidiary is impressive and vital to the successful completion of this engineering marvel. The project includes the construction of 32 piers, supported by a total of 245 piles, with varying pipe diameters ranging from 2,300 mm to 2,500 mm. These piles boast exceptional lengths, extending from 50 meters to an astonishing 115 meters, ensuring the structural stability and integrity of the bridge. One of the most critical aspects of the project is the creation of rock sockets that provide additional support to the piles. These rock sockets have lengths ranging from 1 meter to 5 meters, further anchoring the foundation in the challenging seabed terrain of the Pearl Delta. Bauer's engineering prowess and experience in such complex geotechnical conditions are instrumental in overcoming the unique challenges posed by constructing a bridge of this magnitude over water. The project also encompasses the construction of the Hong Kong Link Road, a crucial 9.4-kilometer viaduct with a dual three-lane carriageway designed to facilitate smooth vehicular traffic from Hong Kong International Airport to the HKSAR boundary. This section of the bridge is a testament to Bauer's commitment to creating seamless transportation solutions for the region. In addition to the structural elements, Bauer is responsible for the meticulous installation of an impressive 12,600 tons of steel cage, as well as the precise placement of an astounding 63,900 cubic meters of concrete. These figures underscore the magnitude of the project and highlight Bauer's capabilities in executing large-scale construction tasks. To meet the ambitious project timeline, Bauer Specialty Bau GmbH's team is working diligently, installing an impressive three to four piles each week. This remarkable pace The construction of the Hong Kong Zhu High Macau Bridge, an ambitious bridge tunnel bridge connection between the cities of Hong Kong, Zhu High, and Macau, required the installation of massive tubular piles to create artificial islands for the transition between the bridge and tunnel sections. All Namex, along with Ape, USA, Ape Holland, and Ape China, played a crucial role in the successful installation of these 22 meter diameter tubular piles. The purpose of the tunnel section, spanning 6.75 kilometers in length, was to facilitate the passage of container ships to and from the South China Sea. To achieve this, two artificial islands were constructed, each in an oval shape and filled with sand. The islands comprised 60 cells, which were essentially gigantic tubular piles interconnected by steel wings with an 11-meter diameter. The tube's wall thickness ranged from 12 to 14 millimeters, and struts were welded inside to prevent deformation. In November 2010, All Namex, Ape, USA, Ape Holland, and Ape China collaborated to present an innovative solution to the Chinese contractor First Harbor Engineering Company. Their proposal involved using multiple vibratory hammers operating as one unit to install the 50-meter-long steel tubes, each weighing 600 tons, 25 meters deep into the seabed of the South China Sea. The seabed had a soil profile consisting of clay and sand layers with varying SPTN values from 8 to 40. The success of this installation method depended on the precise drivability assessments conducted by All Namek's vibratory driving predictions. These predictions were carried out using their in-house developed software, AllWave PDP, based on the method of characteristics for stress wave propagation in piles, originally a Dutch development. Moreover, the software incorporated an adapted beta method to model the degradation of friction. On May 5, 2011, the installation process began, and the first pile was successfully driven 25 meters into the seabed in an impressive 7.5 minutes, precisely in line with the vibratory driving predictions. The Ape Octacong was the equipment used for this task. Over the course of the following months, the installation of all 120 piles was completed, achieving the desired penetration depth according to the design. 
The application of this innovative and efficient method proved highly successful as the project was completed approximately five months ahead of the overall plan schedule. The collaboration between Allnamics, Ape USA, Ape Holland, and Ape China, with their expertise in vibratory hammers, construction, logistics, and drivability assessments, ensured the installation of the tubular piles proceeded smoothly and met the project's stringent requirements. The installation process begins with aligning and joining two steel sheets. This requires three individuals working together carefully. Proper alignment is essential to ensure the stability and integrity of the structure. As the new sheets are lowered, they may face some resistance when they come in contact with the already driven sheets due to slight misalignment. By doing so, adjustments can be made more easily as a group. Once a sheet is fully driven, it becomes challenging to correct any misalignment or plumb issues without affecting the overall structure. The vibratory hammer induces vibration, making the driving process quicker and more efficient. It should be noted that the speed of driving should not be confused with the overall production rate, as setup time and alignment efforts play a significant role. One of the significant challenges encountered during the installation is the separation of newly driven sheets from the already driven ones. This can happen when the new sheets do not ride freely within the driven sheets, causing them to get hung up and separate. To prevent this, tack welding the sheets together is a common practice to ensure they stay aligned during the driving process. Cutting corners or neglecting proper alignment and welding can lead to complications, as shown in the example where sheets became misaligned and separated. Safety should always be a priority, and experienced foremen can play a vital role in ensuring a successful and incident-free installation process. The process of driving steel sheet piling is a critical step in various construction projects. It involves aligning and joining sheets, partially driving them for easier adjustments, and using a vibratory hammer for efficient driving. Challenges can arise if proper practices are not followed, emphasizing the importance of experienced foremen and a commitment to safety. By adhering to best practices, the installation of steel sheet piling can be carried out successfully providing a strong foundation for various structures and infrastructure projects. In the pursuit of a more sustainable future, the recycling of aluminum has become a vital component of the circular flow economy. Aluminum, a lightweight and versatile metal, is extensively used in various industries, including beverage cans, automobiles, and electronics, However, the challenge has always been in effectively recycling aluminum alloys, which are comprised of numerous distinct elements. The dream of creating a true circular flow economy for aluminum, where products are recycled into similar products without the need for significant additions of primary aluminum, has been realized to a significant extent at hydro-aluminum recycling in Gelsenkirchen, Germany. One of the fundamental challenges in aluminum recycling has been the complexity of separating and recycling various aluminum alloys. These alloys are used for different purposes, such as creating window frames or manufacturing automobile components. In traditional recycling processes, significant amounts of primary aluminum needed to be added to achieve the right mixture of alloys for specific products, However, producing primary aluminum from raw bauxite is an energy-intensive process. Therefore, finding ways to recycle aluminum alloys without relying heavily on primary aluminum has been a crucial objective for environmental engineers. At Hydro Aluminum Recycling, a novel recycling facility has been established to tackle the complexities of aluminum recycling, 
Their mission is not just to separate plastics and other metals from old aluminum frames, but also to isolate aluminum alloys with heavy metals that are unsuitable for certain applications. The process starts with the shredding of old aluminum window frames. During this phase, magnetic separators and eddy current separators extract metal screws, hinges, rubber, wood, and plastic from the material flow, resulting in a nearly pure aluminum waste stream. However, this stream still contains unsuitable materials and alloys, such as old aluminum handles and rivets. To address this issue, an innovative approach is taken. A second shredder phase is introduced, where the material is shredded into chips of about 4 to 6 centimeters. These chips are subjected to a screening process to ensure a nearly homogeneous geometry, allowing for precise sorting in the subsequent steps. The pivotal step in the recycling process involves the use of advanced X-ray technology. The shredded aluminum chips are examined using powerful X-ray sources with an energy of 160 kilo electron volts. This technology allows for the detection of individual fragments and the differentiation of alloys based on the amount of radiation absorbed. Unwanted alloys containing high levels of copper or zinc can be identified and separated on a conveyor belt, where over 1,000 parts per second can be analyzed and sorted. A computer-controlled system operates air jets that blow off the unsuitable material. Based on the alloy composition identified through X-ray analysis, this cutting-edge technology, supported by the German Environment Ministry's Environmental Innovation Program, enables the sorting of aluminum alloys with remarkable precision. Through this innovative shredder and sorting technology, hydro-aluminum recycling achieves a significant reduction in the use of primary aluminum. A specific alloy, 6060, commonly used for window frames, can be recycled in quantities of up to 30,000 tons per year. These recycled alloys can be seamlessly incorporated into the production of aluminum billets, essential materials for aluminum profiles used in various industries. The recycled material is melted down, and extrusion billets are produced without the need for extensive amounts of primary aluminum. This holistic process, from recycling to remanufacturing, leads to a remarkable reduction in CO2 emissions, contributing to environmental protection and resource conservation. Hydro-aluminum recycling's achievements in aluminum recycling represent a significant leap towards a perfect circular flow economy for aluminum. By effectively separating alloys and reusing them for similar products, the company not only saves valuable materials, but also reduces energy consumption and environmental impact. The success of this endeavor extends beyond window frames, reaching industries like beverage cans, automobile manufacturing, and more. As technology continues to evolve, the engineers at Hydro-Aluminum Recycling aim to refine the process even further. Their ultimate goal is to expand the range of alloys that can be recycled without the need for primary aluminum additions. This would create a truly closed-loop system where aluminum products, from beverage cans to cars, can be perpetually recycled into new iterations, ushering in a more sustainable and resource-efficient future.